I want to be honest and upfront here. My talk today is going to be about that four-letter word. You know what I'm talking about? I can see some of you getting a little anxious. Uh, decidedly, a couple of you are mildly curious about what this is. But don't worry, it's not what you're thinking. I'm going to be speaking about this element called luck. That four-letter word, which is part of our lives, whether we like it or not. Some of us are in awe of it. Some of us are mildly possibly scared of it. But whether we will like it or not, luck is a part of our lives. And we just have to internalize it and accept it for what it is. I mean, think about it. When they're trying to get you married, and, and right now I'm talking about those people who either didn't have the luck or didn't have the efficiency to pick up a boyfriend or a girlfriend and convince them to walk up the altar with them. When you're, you, your folks at home, your parents, they try to get you hitched and set up a marital alliance for you, they inevitably get hold of a consultant, someone we know colloquially as a Panditji. Now this gentleman, the first port of call for this gentleman is this uh, document that's called your horoscope. You're all familiar with that, right? Now, when he gets hold of this horoscope, he flips through it, he examines it in great detail, identifies um, planetary alignments, and I'm not too sure what, what else happens down there. But at the end of the entire process, he gets to a situation where he takes a call, whether that marital engagement is a go or a no-go. Now, let's be clear. I, I, this is not just about um, an odd nuptial agreement that we're talking about. This pervades uh, our life in its entirety, right? From, from birth till death and everything in between. <coughs> What, what happens here is that you pick up anything that happens in life, right? Uh, a naming ceremony for your child. Um, you, you're going on a travel expedition. You want to be sure about what time you should go, the muhurat for that. Um, the exam that you guys took um, you know, sometime in, in life, each of this has goes through a process of invoking the divine blessings. Just your luck. Literally, aapka bhagya khul raha hai. And that's how it happens in life. But, so therefore, is there, a, is there a methodology involved in identifying that luck, in creating your luck, or actually playing around with your luck? Or is it just preordained? Does it just have to do with an alignment with the Almighty, and an intermediary in between. That's what we're going to be examining for a bit. Now, I spent about 20 plus years in the Special Forces Regiment of the Indian Army. Um, all of you, I'm sure, uh, courtesy the, the media blitzkrieg, which had happened post the surgical strikes, many of you are now familiar what, with what the Special Forces is all about. This is a typical Special Forces soldier. Absolute mean machine, muscles rippling over, um, the beard for effect, the weapon in his hands. A completely professional guy, right? And this is me, back at the National Defense Academy many, many years ago. Expectation and reality, right? Expectation and reality. So any similarity or lack of similarity that you see around here is courtesy your imagination actually working perfectly. And you have my apologies for that. But 
I'm going to be talking a little about the special forces, uh, the, the manner that they operate. And uh, like I mentioned, uh, you would be pretty familiar with, that, with the ideology and with the thought process that constitutes a special forces soldier. Uh, what happens is that the special forces as an entity is trained, organized, and equipped to be operating deep behind enemy lines. And because of the nature of their, of their task and their orientation, it becomes essential that only a handful of people are chosen for these kind of tasks. And therefore, there is a very elaborate and a very stringent and exacting selection process that go is to be gone through for selection of volunteers for the special forces. Volunteers are actually drawn from the different branches of the army, and they're put through this intense 90-day period, what we refer to as the probation period, where uh, mental and, and physical stresses are induced, and your biological clock is just thrown out of gear just to examine how the individual performs under those kind of stresses when operating in very small teams behind enemy lines. Right, now, back at the NDA, like you would have figured out from these visuals that I had put to you, um, I wasn't quite the special forces material. Don't get me wrong, I was, I was no wimp. I was decently okay with my physical fitness. In fact, more than decently organized with my physical fitness, but I was not the quint quintessential stud, as they call it. Um, I, I never was this bloke who could uh, go for long runs without any hassles, uh, unlimited reserves of stamina. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, the, the stud, right? I never was that. So when I did volunteer for the special forces, many of my batchmates, in, in army parlance, we call them course mates they were a little surprised because I was taking a risk. A risk because if I were not to get through the probation process, it would invite ridicule, not only from my peer group, but also from my superiors and my uh, subordinates. And therefore, it, it was a risk that I was taking. But I did go ahead and volunteer. I really didn't care. I, I did volunteer. Not that I was not troubled by it, but I did volunteer. But what I did was that I prepared for this event. I steeled myself for the, for the ragada of the probation process that would follow. I built myself up physically, my stamina and everything else, and I went ahead with the probation. At the end of 90 days, I cleared probation, and I was accepted as part of the Special Forces uh, fraternity, I was given the Balidan badge and the maroon beret that we actually die for, literally. Um, having moved into the special forces, some of my course mates, they were still intrigued and th they said, you know what, this guy is just plain lucky. And at that point in time, looking back now, hand on my heart, I quite agreed with them. I thought I was lucky. But now, after so many years, when in rewind mode, when I look back at life, I realize, no, that's not quite correct. It was not just about luck. It was a fact that I took a risk, I organized myself, and I prepared for it. I put in the hard work, I put in the effort, and I engineered my luck. Now, after a couple of years, um, we were deployed in Kashmir. Uh, in a counter-terrorist operation. The entire unit had moved there. And uh, we were going about our business. I was fresh into the Special Forces, and I did not have the experience of operating in classical special ops manner. Uh, there was another colleague of mine, almost a contemporary, a peer. And both of us were eager to go, pushing at the edges, wanting to go out there, make an impact, and, you know, all guns blazing. And then there was this other team commander, about a couple of years senior to me. Uh, no names here. These gentlemen are still serving. Uh, but we'll just, for the purposes of this, uh, of this talk, call him the guru. So the guru, um, he was nonchalant. You know, he, he couldn't be really be bothered. 
And then since we guys were biting at the edges, we would start preparing for our operations. And the manner that we would do it is, we would pick up these maps, plaster them on the wall, and we would start pouring over the details on the map, going over the topography, studying the, the landscape, picking up intelligence briefs, uh, the previous firefights that had happened in that area, um, and all of this. And this is, uh, in, in, like I mentioned, in Kashmir, uh, a place called the Lolab Valley, a beautiful, really beautiful valley there, small little valley, pretty close to the line of control. And what happens there actually is that the terrorists who cross over the line of control come into this small little bowl in Lolab, and that's their staging area. They rest and recoup there, build up their strength, pick up their stuff, and once they are adequately rested, they move into the main Kashmir bowl to do what they do. And so there we were eager to engage these guys and, and make contact with them and eliminate them. That was our role. Now, so as I was mentioning, me and my contemporary as young team leaders, biting at the edge, we would start going over these details to identify that perfect spot where we could go and establish an ambush and enhance our chances of a contact. All this while, Guru would be sitting on the sides, nursing his drink, listening to his music, and not really too bothered about where he's going and where, how he's going. And once we, we did this analysis, um, inevitably we would find that both of us would home on to that small little piece of land in the forest area, which to our assessment would give us the maximum chances of contact. And we would start arguing over it, we would start fighting over it because two teams can't go there, it can only be one team at a time and we would start uh, pressing for getting the rights to go there. And once we had decided and agreed upon uh, a, a certain compromise, uh, Guru would walk in and he would take a look at the map and say, all right, you're going there, you're going there. What's left is this area. Fair enough, I'll go there. So the next two or three days is, goes in the planning and the preparation for this task, for this mission. And we'd go about that planning and the task, and three days later, we would launch ourselves into the mission. The three teams go out. And inevitably, when we go out for such missions, uh, it always happens that these missions are for 72 hours or 96 hours self-contained, where once you go out, you don't have any contact, right? So you're self-contained for everything, for ammunition, for, for uh, uh, your weapons, uh, the food stuff that you carry, and everything else. So we would all head out. And 96 hours later, when uh, both of us would be coming back and we'd get back to our mess, tired and hungry and exhausted and frustrated because we didn't get any success. And once we come in, we would notice Guru sitting in the same chair we left him in, right? He went out along with us, but he's back already. And then when we find out, we realize that Guru has had success in the first 24 hours. He got into his place with his team. In 24 hours, a group of militants would miraculously come into his killing area. He would knock them down, pick up the bodies, like Asterix and Obelix, get them back to base. And we would sit there for three days, four days in the cold of Kashmir. It becomes extremely difficult to be sitting there when you're in sub-zero temperatures and not pretty much stuff that you can keep your, yourself warm. And this was not a one-off activity. It would happen again and again and again, many, many times in a row, right? Every couple of weeks, every couple of months, we would find that we are coming back with no success, and Guru has got success. And it would be frustrating for us, and we, we would examine what, what the hell is going on? What's happening here? And ultimately, we'd come down to the the concept of luck and just say that, you know what, Guru is lucky. Guru is one lucky beep, right? So luck would start, it, it would bother us because it was hurting our professional pride, right? We were taking the effort, and but somehow it wasn't quite working out. And it, it bothered us no end. But ultimately, 
as we got on and we started getting experience and we started observing what Guru was doing, we figured out finally what the hell is happening. What was happening was that Guru used to train and prepare diligently. What he would do is once he had picked up the place that he was going to, he really was not bothered about the location that he was going to, but he would come back and with his team he would start preparing. And the, the manner of preparation was he would go into intricate details. He would start identifying the, the team members that he would come along with him for that mission. Any smoker, a person with a minor cough, a throat irritation maybe is out. The dietary changes that he would bring in into his team for the two to three days before they go in for the operation would be phenomenal. No lesson, no uh, onions, none of the things that would start giving out a body odor. You know what I mean? Uh, he would ensure that the stuff that they would take for that operation, the kind of food that they would take for the operation, the way their weapons were organized, the ammunition was organized, not a single sound would emanate. The entire focus was on creating that environment that they, when they went into the jungle, they were one with the jungle. It wasn't an alien uh, team of people that is coming in. And us, on the other hand, we would be all gung-ho. We would have done our planning on, on the map and discussed and all of that. But we would go in with you know body spray and freshly scrubbed with shampoo and sabun and everything else. And the militants who are operating within the jungle would just pick it up like this. But since they didn't want to establish contact with us, he, they would avoid us. And in the process, they would be channelized into where Guru was sitting in ambush. And he would just knock them down like flies. I, it was a beautiful concept. And as we got along, we just got into the groove and we realized what the hell is happening. And, and Guru being Guru, he let the Shishyas learn. Instead of pushing it down, he let us pull, right? And, and within a couple of months, probably in about a year, year and a half, we had upped our game. And we had reached where possibly Guru was. And, and that's how luck is created. So essentially what Guru was doing was that he didn't bother about the, the cards that were dealt to him. He picked up the cards that were dealt to him, but the amount of diligence, the training, the planning, the preparation with intricate details down to the last bottom point. That is what made him script his success story. And it was a beautiful experience. Now, I'm not trying to stand here and tell you that, uh, you know, luck, there is nothing called luck. Of course, there is something called luck. Uh, you can script your luck. But essentially, the point that I'm trying to make to you, or the case that I'm building, a very strong, deliberate, argued, evidence-based case that I'm making to you, is that if you develop the ability to take a risk and have the passion, the belief, and the diligence to put in the effort to back that up, you are done you can engineer your luck. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs>